Welcome to the LSU NCBRT Preparedness Podcast. I'm your host, Ashley Markle. I'm a curriculum development specialist here at NCBRT, and I work in collaboration with subject matter experts to create valuable and timely training for the responder community. The National Center for Biomedical Research and Training provides mobile training to both the national and international emergency response community. Today on the podcast, we're talking to Roy Bethke, Max Guerin, and Courtney Tassin about the problems associated with officer mental health and survival. Roy Bethke is the chief of police in Cherry Valley, Illinois. He spent nearly 28 years and retired as deputy police chief in Buffalo, in Buffalo Grove, Illinois. He chairs the Education and Training Committee for the International Association of Chiefs of Police, and he is also a subject matter expert and instructor for LSU and CBRT. Max Guerin has over 30 years of experience in law enforcement, primarily with the Dallas Police Department, where he retired as a major over the Criminal Investigations Bureau. Currently, he serves as the Senior Director of Health and Public Safety at Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute, where he works across institute teams and disciplines to advance the Institute's work in public safety crisis systems transformation, including early mental health emergency identification, call center triage, and multidisciplinary response teams advancement and implementation. He is also a subject matter expert and instructor for LSU and CBRT. Courtney Tassin is a licensed professional counselor and is the crisis intervention program manager for the city of Aurora, Colorado, where she oversees three co-responder teams. Prior to this role, she served as a co-responder and targeted violence prevention specialist for the Aurora Police Department. She is a subject matter expert with LSU NCBRT and is a master trainer for the Department of Homeland Security's National Threat Evaluation and Reporting Program. Thank you to Roy, Max, and Courtney for coming on the podcast and sharing with us today. If you or someone you know is a first responder seeking mental health support, text BADGE to 741-741. This is a free confidential service through the foundation Responders Strong. Anyone facing a mental health crisis can always call 988. All right, so to start us off today, um, what do you think are the big problems in mental health in the responder community? I feel like the elephant in the room, excuse me, is always suicide. I think first responders have a rate of suicide that's about seven times higher than the general population. And I think there's plenty of things that we'll get into in this episode that'll talk about why. But I think that's one of the biggest things that we don't like to look at. Oftentimes, our responders are the ones who are showing up to the scene of a suicide or showing up to the scene of someone who is experiencing suicidal ideation. But in addition to that, we see substance use, we just see depression as a whole. and um, just situational stress that causes disruption in their everyday life. It's a complicated conversation. It, it certainly, if we look at the last few years uh, in the responder community, law enforcement uh, specifically, since that's really my background. Uh, I mean, who wants to be a cop since 2020? You, you could argue, even going back a few more years, right? The, the negative public sentiment, the mainstream media attacks on law enforcement, the social media attacks on law enforcement. Uh, and unfortunately, that actually isn't true as I travel around the country and talk to so many community members that are so supportive of law enforcement, but they're getting drowned out by uh, all of this noise. Uh, it's a tough time to bring people into you know, the responder professions. It doesn't matter what it is. Uh, you always hear the joke, everybody loves firemen, but uh, firemen have, have a pretty difficult job too. So how do we do that? And, and to Courtney's point on the suicide space, I mean, it wasn't up until a couple of years ago that on the law enforcement side, we even counted or tracked law enforcement suicides. We've been tracking line of duty deaths forever. There's more than 20,000 names on a wall in Washington, DC that memorialize the officers killed in the line of duty. And that's a a very important historic place for those of us that serve in this profession. But um, I wonder how many suicides uh, before we started tracking that we haven't paid attention to. And again, it's, it's a super complicated topic. But for example, this year alone, there's 167 known and reported suicides. 
Uh, that doesn't even account for the ones that we don't know about or weren't reported as a suicide or they were a, a car crash where there was no real evidence that it was a suicide, but you know, those odd questions are lingering. So uh, the mental health side is, is incredibly important and it's a complicated conversation to have. I'm excited we're having it. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more uh, with, with, with both of you. Um, we are uh, thankfully, uh, in some regards, in, in a transition. Uh, we have been my, my entire career. We have, we've rec begun to recognize that, that there, there are problems and we aren't necessarily equipped to handle those problems on our own. Um, and, uh, but it absolutely has, it, in some ways it's gotten better, in some ways it's gotten worse. Um, and, and, and I think as bad as it's gotten, um, for, for the, for the officers, um, we're, we're seeing agencies now realizing that, Hey, we need to, we need to bring in help. We need to, we need to do things differently. And, um, uh, it's, uh, not only addressing the trauma that, 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 that is witnessed and experienced on the job. It's, it's life skills. It's, uh, it's all of that. And how do we set up our personnel to be successful? You talk about um, uh, monetary issues, how, uh, savings, um, not getting in, into credit card debt. The, you know, we're, just because they're police officers, they're not immune from the regular normal stressors of life. Uh, so how can we uh, better equip them um, to, to address those things? And I think to Max's point, I think we are seeing and we're beginning to see a shift and a better focus on, on mental health in the responder community. I don't think we're doing it fast enough, and I think there are always going to be some roadblocks. But, you know, I've been in this profession, this is my 35th year in law enforcement, and I think about like when I first started, we, we were actually pretty good at, at providing some type of counseling or care for a single critical incident. But what we haven't really paid enough attention to uh, is the long-term cumulative stress and a post-traumatic stress that occurs in, in every responder community, whether it's firefighters or heck, even nurses or doctors in emergency rooms. And a great book called The Body Keeps the Score by Bezel van der Kolk, which really gets a, a deep dive in, into the concept of you know post-traumatic stress and that cumulative stress. But I mean, how many times do you go to a car crash scene and you know, well, everybody survived except that blood and gore brings back a memory from some other incident and, and you know, then add personal trauma or personal challenges, divorces, you know, alcoholism, pick a thing. Uh, and I think we need to do a better job of understanding that these are really, really difficult professions. And uh, over time, we need to continue to change the stigma and make sure that we're caring for those responders because they care for us and they care for our communities. I think we have that obligation. And to just kind of piggyback on that, I think we've seen the emergence of wellness programs. We've seen the emergence of embedding psychologists and clinicians within the police departments and even peer supports. I think that's become really big. I know at my agency, there's been a huge shift and we're looking at it more from the prevention space rather than the reactive space. I think oftentimes law enforcement and first responders as a whole, it's in the name, respond, not necessarily prevent. So I think we often are very focused on the reactivity of responding to a critical event. How do we provide you know, support and resources for those who've experienced that? But to Max's point, how do we set them up to deal with that before they even have that event? So things like you know, peer support and things like that are great, but if we're not teaching them the skills of how to cope and how to handle these situations and to not take it off at the end of the day, we're never going to solve the problem. So I love that this conversation is bringing that in as well. Yeah, I think when I came on, uh, I think we were already at 50% of uh, police marriages ended in divorce. I'm sure we're higher than that now. And and what, what did we do? We we talked about it and just just acknowledging that that was all we did. Uh, we didn't we didn't we didn't plan ahead uh, to to number one help that number to be reduced um, or help our officers to, 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 to not repeat the same mistakes. Uh, we just talked about, yep, uh, divorce is high. Um, and, and we, we, we in, injected humor and with uh, comments like starter wives and starter husbands and, and just kind of glossed over the fact that, Hey, yeah, this is bad. And we should, we should do something about it to, to, to change it. Um, and, it, we, we've got to, we get, to Roy's job, point, we've got to do a better job. I mean, we, we, good is good, but we can do better. 
And I think too, we'd be remiss to not talk about how the culture really affects all of this. I mean, as first responders, you're supposed to be the hero. You're supposed to be the one who can handle everyone else's problems and you have to be strong. And sometimes I think we confuse strong with the ability to just manage our lives instead of compartmentalizing it and then forgetting about it. Um, you know, it just festers. It's like a wound. You wouldn't just leave a gunshot wound alone and not take care of it. You've got to take care of the mental wounds too. I mean, to Roy's point, these are the people who see awful things every single day and they're putting their lives on the line to save the lives of others and responding to people on their worst day. And it would be silly of us to think that that doesn't stick with them. In fact, I mean, in, in my own teams, everyone has one call that just really hits them hard. Maybe it reminds them of their own personal lives. Maybe it reminds them of a friend. Who knows? But everyone's had that one call and we're not immune to it. You know, we might be the heroes. You guys might be the heroes, but you're not immune to the same situational stress and the ability to go into crisis like anyone else. I think the perfect example of that and kind of to expand on what both Max and Courtney said is, you know, how do how do kids, how do young people learn about these first responder professions initially, right? Generally, it's somebody that's in the family or more common, it's from TV. And it really isn't until the last couple of years that you've seen, you know, TV cop shows address and be willing to say that somebody might need some psychological help as a first responder. It was taboo until then. You watch, you know, whatever famous cop movie you, you want to talk about. There, there's very rarely that kind of care or aftercare. They're that hero that Courtney talked about busting through windows and taking down the bad guy. Uh, and then they go, you know, home and everything's great, except uh, that's not reality. That's just not real. And uh, we have to, again, do a better job. And again, I think we're beginning to do that by having conversations like this and being willing to to address it. Uh, but I can tell you that as a, as a police chief, uh, I talk to cops all the time, not just my own agency, that are still deathly afraid to mention that, that they may be struggling or they might need some help. And we've got to get past that. Everybody needs help at some point. You know, recently, uh, and, and I won't discuss the agency, but uh, uh, there was, even, even, even today, there are issues with, with acknowledging, number one, acknowledging suicide uh, and rendering any kind of honors to an officer who succumbs to suicide. Um, and we've, we've got to change that stigma too. Uh, we, and, and the way we change that is we, we, we have to, we have to normalize the conversation around it. We have to, we have to get rid of the taboo. We have to uh, acknowledge that these are tough conversations, but as, as leaders and, and uh, in, in not only agencies, but uh, in communities, uh, down to the rank and file officer. They are leaders. We have to have those conversations and, and get rid of the stigma uh, and, and say, this is a, it's a tough, tough conversation to have, but we have to have it for the betterment of our, of our people. And we found even within my department that people are hesitant to go to the psych services contract we have over fear that, oh, well, it was what I'm talking about going to be leaked to my command staff. Is this information really safe? Um, you know, regardless of how much we tell them it's confidential, there's a big fear there. Is it going to mean that I'm not fit for duty? Are they going to take away my gun? Are they going to take away my job? There's a lot that people feel rides on this. And you're absolutely right. And I'm glad we're talking about the stigma today. And you're absolutely right. It's up to command staff and for it to come from the top down of decreasing that. But honestly, I think it's a culture just across any military, paramilitary structure. I mean, you look at the military, the military suicide rates are, if not even higher than first responders. And sorry, Roy and Max, but it's a super male dominated field thing. So we find that a lot, you know, within any kind of male dominated field, there's a huge fear in it. I'm not going to go super psych, psych brain into this, but it's all about how we socialize men and women from the time that they're kids all the way up. Boys don't cry. Girls are just emotional. I mean, all of that contributes to these fields. And, you know, law enforcement being a male dominated field, being so based on being strong and the heroes, it looks weak. People feel like it looks weak to show the human side of them. And that's just not true. I'll add to that, Courtney. I read a book uh, years ago called Inside Out Coaching by Joe Ehrman, and he kind of took on the, the male-dominated sports world, right? Um, from when kids start sports, talking specifically about boys, like what does it mean to be a man when you get hurt, man up, and all those conversations. To Courtney's point, you know, don't, don't cry or 
rub some dirt on it and move on. And, and it's a problem for us. Like we set these expectations and then it leads into the same type of culture issues we have. Again, I can speak specific to the law enforcement profession. And remember that law enforcement leadership is generally a generation behind, right? So, so you've got people often in leadership positions that they didn't have to get psych services or they, they dealt with their issue or whatever. So when their officers are struggling, they don't know what to do with it. They don't know what services are out there. And far too often, what, what you hear those people in those leadership positions say is, well, it wasn't a problem for me and it's just a dead body or it's just a, and those are completely unacceptable and unreasonable conversations to have with people. You know, we're not comparing apples and oranges at all, but everybody needs care. I think if you, you look at um, that divorce rate that we talk about or talked about earlier in the podcast, um, you know, start breaking down the alcoholism rate or uh, if it's not alcoholism by classical definition, maybe it's just an overconsumption too often of alcohol. Uh, it's the, the drug addiction. And I'm not talking about illegal drugs. Often what we're talking about is prescription drugs that, that people are on. And, and it's a problem for us. The obesity rate, all of it plays into this conversation. The, the sleeping pills, because you're working midnight shift for far too many years. And it is a super, super difficult problem to deal with. And again, it starts by talking about it. It starts by uh, leadership in organizations being willing to acknowledge it and have a plan and also knowing that they may not have all the answers and knowing where to go to find those answers. And there's some great organizations out there uh, that are providing some of those resources. You know, I'll tag on to what Courtney was talking about. Um, if you if you only have one example of strength and that strength is is strong silence uh, and, and sucking it up, um, then you're going to continue to try to perpetuate that. Um, but once you realize, uh, and, I, and I love the, the writings and the talkings of Brene Brown, when she talks about vulnerability as strength, um, because what that does is that gives real examples of, of, of struggles. I mean, we're, we're constantly comparing ourselves to the reality or that we believe is whatever we believe the reality is that we're seeing on the outsides of others. And we're not seeing their struggles. We're not seeing uh, the times that, that they're hurting or they're breaking down. And so we're, we're comparing ourselves to this, this false facade, if you will, and, and judging ourselves. Why can't I keep it together? Why, why can't I, uh, uh, handle the struggles in my life as, as, as well as, as this other person that I'm seeing, you know, we talk about that in social media all the time. You only get the best, you know, you're not going to post your worst photographs on social media. You're going to post the best ones and, and you're always having fun and you're always on vacation and you're doing great things. Uh, so it's no wonder that, that we have this disparity between reality and what we, what our perceived reality is. Um, so I think one of the biggest things that we can do about that is, is to, is to be vulnerable be appropriately vulnerable to, to those around us and to, to our subordinates, to our coworkers. Uh, and because when you get that idea and that understanding, oh, it's hard for them too. Um, and they don't have all the answers, or maybe they've got an answer that will help me, but, but we don't have all the answers. Then we begin to see how, how people can turn the corner and, and, and work on improvement and, and start coping uh, better and, and in healthier ways with, with the challenges and the stressors of the job and life. And that vulnerability piece is so important to, to talk about, you know, from a law, again, law enforcement specific perspective, the, the word vulnerability scares us. Like we can't be physically vulnerable to attack or to, you know, something bad happen. And, and, and we extend that into, well, we can't be emotionally vulnerable. And I also love Brene Brown's work. And, and I think, again, admitting that uh, emotional vulnerability is okay. Having uh, conversations, honest conversations about hard, how hard these professions are and how hard uh, these challenges are and knowing what that appropriate outlet is, is so vital uh, to what we do. And, and normalizing those conversations, as both Courtney and Max keep saying, we, we've got to normalize conversations around um, these very, very difficult, stressful issues. And we can't do it fast enough. And I think too, like, when we talk about not only is this important in the sense of saving your people, I think that's primary, right? But also looking at it from a liability standpoint, use is a force. It is shown that officers who are struggling and maybe don't have a handle on their mental health may not make as good decisions. And that's generalizable to the entire population. Someone who is not mentally in a good spot will make decisions that are more risky, will make decisions that are maybe less thought out because they just can't organize that within their brain. So when we look at it from a liability standpoint, 
uses of forces could be much you know, less justified. They might be more exaggerated than they need to be. And I'm not a cop and I don't pretend to be, and I don't do use of force reviews or anything like that. But from the psychological standpoint side, people make worse decisions when they're not taking care of their mental health. And we do see that. We do see officers who have been an amazing officer their entire career when they have one bad day, maybe. And you look at it in the background and you say, wow, they had all of these different stressors and all of these behavior changes. And then one day he just snapped, for lack of better terms. And he had this really awful, unjustifiable use of force or this excessive force. So I think, you know, from that standpoint, too, of like for command staff, what's in it for you? It's not only is this saving your people so you have the people to go save others. But it's also so that you're saving your your entire department as a whole. And I think, too, it's super important, and I'm sure we'll get into it later, to talk about what even the warning signs are for an officer who is struggling and how difficult it can be to intervene on a peer in that kind of shape or form. Courtney, to your point, I, I love the fact that we're kind of pushing back on law enforcement leadership. I'm completely comfortable with that. But really what we're talking about is pushing back on the culture of law enforcement and leaders creating a, a, a healthy, open culture in the organizations. Because I can tell you as a police chief, I'm responsible for a bunch of people, uh, including patrol officers who are several levels in rank, you know, below my, my rank. I don't see them every day. I don't know everything that they're doing, but their peers are and their immediate supervisors are. And, and if we're gonna be successful to Courtney's point, most of the time there are some indicators that somehow got missed. It's no different than if we talk about targeted violence or active threats, it's the same theory, same concept. Those indicators have to be uh, noticed. Someone has to be willing to address them and have to normalize the, the asking for help and even forcing people to get help. Uh, and it, it's a challenging conversation. And, and as much as we wanna you know, lump every law enforcement agency, every you know, fire department, every first responder into some single entity, it, it's just not that simple because one of the biggest challenges uh, specific to law enforcement, and, and people make the comparison or use the term paramilitary or we're a military-like uh, profession, except the piece that's missing is, and Courtney mentioned, the military has even bigger problems in this space, although I think they were ahead of us in trying to address them. Every military branch, all five of them, they all report to one person in a single office in Washington, D.C. In law enforcement specifically, we've got 18,000 police agencies, federal, tribal, state, special police, hospital police. There isn't somebody in some office somewhere in D.C. or anywhere else that's in charge of all of them. So you have all these different agencies with all these different responsibilities and all these different cultures. And we're, we're trying to, in some ways, simplify the response to that. And it's not that easy. Uh, but again, we're, we're making progress. It's just not coming fast enough. The phrase that comes to mind is herding cats. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you've got, uh, we, we talk about, well, standardization. Um, there, there is, uh, like we said, there's, there's no one police force. There, there's, there's a prevailing pr police culture that you could, you could, it's like a layer you could you could overlay on almost every police department but it's it's only got a few things and then then the the for each agency they have their own personality their own culture the, within those organizations uh that are some are similar some are some are different uh some are better skilled some are are not as skilled so yeah it is a, it's a it's a heavy lift when you start talking about um uh, officer health and wellness for a, a department like New York or Los Angeles versus someone uh, a place like Uvalde, Texas, or 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 Marfa, uh, some small one or two officer department uh, somewhere. How do we how do we positively Im impact those uh, uh, those cultures in those departments? Um, I, I'm I'm encouraged by uh, by the active bystandership movement and the and the recognition of of human inhibitors uh, to, to both intervention uh, for uh, where, where force is concerned, but also, uh, like to, to Courtney and Roy's point, intervention where uh, suicidal ideology is concerned and depression and, and anxiety noticed in, in co-workers. Uh, I think that um, it, it, it's all scientific. Um, and, and for years, uh, police departments have, have said, and I've, I've said this before, yeah, we 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 teach you in the academy that anything can kill you because in some form or fashion for some police officer somewhere it has. Um, 
and we we build the state of hypervigilance. <clears throat> Excuse me. And and then we also teach you that um, that you have to rely on your brother and, and sister officers to come uh, to your to your aid when you when you need it. Uh, and then we also tell you, oh, by the way, if they do something wrong, you have to report that. You have to say something about it. And then we we so we built this moral dilemma. Well, what do I do? And then we said, good luck. And figure it out on your own. We, you, we, you're a good person. We hired you because you're a good person. So you figure that out. All the while going, man, I, I, I don't want to be in that situation. I'm not sure what I would do. So these bystandership programs, uh, from from that aspect, teaching why we why we feel this way, and why we why we feel anxious if we see something wrong, and we have to we have to then report it and say something, and and teaching us how to walk through that process to make good decisions. Uh, to get people help when they need it so that we can save lives uh, of our brothers and sisters, save careers, save families, uh, and and improve uh, the overall culture of our profession as well. Max, I love that you brought up the hypervigilance piece, because when we look at statistics, SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration years ago, did a report saying about one in three first responders develop PTSD. And I think that's something that people are so afraid to identify with. And I had a conversation probably a week or so ago with an officer who was filling out his disability paperwork because he's a veteran as well. He's like, I don't think I can claim that. I don't think I can claim PTSD. I mean, yeah, I have nightmares, but you know, it's not that bad. And like, it's not nearly as bad as some of the people I've gone out on. And it's this comparison culture of like, oh, well, I, it's not me because people have it worse which, you know, it's a huge inhibitor in any kind of helper field. Roy brought up doctors and nurses, and oftentimes we have the worst of the worst situations to compare our own mental health to and saying, well, you know, I'm doing just fine, but really you're not. If you're having to change parts of your day so that you can cope and survive with it, you are experiencing some sort of mental health concern, and that's okay. I think that's the biggest thing is it's okay to have a diagnosis, it's okay to you know identify with symptoms of a diagnosis, even if you're not diagnosed. But to be able to seek help and identify it within yourself, I think that's a really big piece lacking too. Not only in law enforcement, but in many careers, it's the self awareness piece. You know, where am I truly at on the spectrum? What am I really seeing in myself? And I think first responders, especially, love to compartmentalize. And well, I can't see it; it doesn't exist, and that's not true. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier, we wouldn't let a bullet wound fester. Why are we going to let this kind of wound fester too? And Courtney, I love, I love what you said. And I think that's why that, that courageous culture is so important, right? Oftentimes, and I know I just went through this myself, it, it took a, a colleague and a close friend to tap me on the shoulder and say, hey, do you think maybe there's something else going on? Maybe you're, you're doing too much. You're going too fast. You're doing, and yeah, I was in that space and, and you know, going down that drain and I guess I knew it. I just wasn't paying attention to it until a, a close friend who knows me really well, who's known me for a long time, literally tapped me out and said, hey, you need to breathe. Like you, You're doing too much. You're going to end up uh, going down that drain and it's not going to end well for you. Yeah, so that's really what we're after, like the, creating those cultures and empowering people to have courageous conversations with one another from every aspect, whether it's you know the obvious behavior or the longer term, not sleeping enough, that kind of stuff. We, we wanna help, we wanna be the heroes, as was already said, um, but we can't always be. At some point, we all need some help. You know, I'm not gonna do this justice, but I, I know that the, uh, the US Navy, uh, for, for its fighter pilots, they, they have, um, uh, it's, it's like a stress test. And again, I'm, I'm not doing it justice, but it, 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 it it has a lists of, of significant events, life events, you know, um, a divorce, death of partner, death of a close loved one and things like that. And it puts it on an index and they generally don't they don't want their pilots flying if their their stress index is above a, a certain point, uh, which is fairly low. Uh, uh, and and I and I took this test and I and I for myself personally. Um, the, the stress level couldn't have been a fighter pilot. I could not have flown the stress and the events that I had dealt with were just, were, were, were several hundred points higher than, than that. And I thought about other officers and, and colleagues and things, and that was, that was more normal than, than having lower, uh, stress. And, and so they, and they, I say that because they recognize that, that to Courtney's point, if, if you're stressed out and, 
uh, you're not coping with it well and you're living in your lizard brain and your amygdala is firing uh, and you're in this fight or flight reaction, no, you're not going to make good, thoughtful um, uh, decisions. Um, you know, we, we tell we tell our kids, don't make decisions when you're angry or when you're upset. Take calm down. And yet we we tend to push ourselves yeah, and, and, and say, yeah, I, I'm OK for me. I'm, I'm, I'm doing OK. I can make these decisions. And again, our, our comparison is, is skewed because we're looking at, 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 at others who are who are off the charts as well. Thank you. And we touched on this, and obviously this is a very complex issue, but how does the culture in police departments contribute to things like suicidality, substance abuse, and burnout um, in this community? So I think without overgeneralizing, uh, it really is department by department. But, you know, we, we talk it's really since for the last four or five years, we've talked a great deal in this country about procedural justice and and how law enforcement agencies need to do a better job of caring for their communities and being fair and reasonable and equitable policing. But yet, if you talk to a lot of cops that I know out of those 18,000 police departments, uh, they'll tell you the first place that they don't get procedural justice or they uh, appear or there appears to be inequity is in their own agencies. That just being treated unfairly by bosses, by command staff, and you know, getting passed over for promotions. And, um, all of that is super challenging, but we can't expect our police officers to care for their communities if they're not being cared for in their own agencies. And again, that's that that cultural piece. And what's sad about the entire process, and when you think about you know law enforcement specifically, depending uh, on what state you're in or, or what uh, retirement system you're in, you know the average career is somewhere between 20 and 35 years. Uh, it's probably shorter now. I don't know what the actual number looks like. But I mentioned that you know we're one generation away from from anything. We're also in a healthy culture, an organization that's built a super healthy culture. We're one leader away from destroying that culture. The next person comes up doesn't have the same beliefs about policies or mental health and can undo everything good that an agency has done for the last ten or twelve or fifteen years. Uh, and it's a repetitive cycle, so it, it's incredibly difficult. But um, again, if we focus in on, on those courageous cultures and empowering individuals you know, to be the, the truth teller, for lack of a better term, uh, in each other's lives and, and make sure that that's a focus. I think that can help us, you know, breach that culture, that those cultural issues that we have. And I think we touched on it a lot too, but just the hero dynamic of first responders as a whole. But I also think that there is this perceived worry of, you know, if I'm struggling and I'm openly admitting that I'm struggling, are the people I'm going on scene with gonna trust me to be their cover? Are they going to alienate me and isolate me because maybe they're afraid now that I can't do my job effectively? So I think there's just, I think Max touched on it perfectly. But you have to rely on each other on these scenes, on these calls. And like Roy said, we can't be physically vulnerable to harm. And a lot of that is trust within this agency. And there's a lot of fear that, you know, my peers will lose trust in me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Your reputation is is the, the, the cornerstone of, of of your identity in policing, and that uh, we have all of these colorful names uh, for for people that we don't trust in this profession, uh, and so you 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 don't want you don't want to um, be labeled something that that you that, that you don't like, um, and we get into this profession to help people and to uh, like. like like we said, you, 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 you're the one that comes in in the emergency, and you, you figure that you figure it out, and you put everything right again, or you at least stabilize it. And you're you're the one that does that, and you're, you're loath to think that that you are the one that needs help because we don't like feeling that way. We don't like feeling like we're being a burden on someone else, and and if uh, admitting and admitting that we need help um, creates that feeling in us, then we want to avoid that at all costs. Um, so we've got to we got to change how how we do that so that it's it it, it doesn't carry that same weight um, that it that, that it's it's just everybody goes through it and 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 it's okay uh, to go through it uh, and and it's like you know we if if we get injured we understand like Courtney's point you get a gunshot wound um, 
we, we all want to do what we need to do to get better and uh, take our medicine and have the surgery or do whatever we need so that we can get back to functioning um, at, a, at a normal, uh, in a normal fashion. We have to understand that, and I think we can do this if, if we can more associate mental illness and, and, and stress, and not just mental illness, but stress and, and post-traumatic stress and the things that police officers deal with and, and equate that to, um, uh, to, to methods and means for improving mental health and wellness and decreasing stress, then police officers are more, in my opinion, are more apt to say, this is part of the job. Here's what I need to do to get better. And it reduces that stigma. It's just, it, it, if, we can, if we can see a pathway forward for ourselves and for our colleagues and say, oh, okay, this happened to me. So in order to get better, I need to do this. And just like with any injury, I think we'll see a, a gradual um, increase of acceptance and understanding that th these things are normal and there are things that we can do to improve. I really wish we pushed mental wellness as much as we push physical wellness in the academy. You know, we make our recruits run however many miles a week. We don't teach them how to take care of themselves at all. We don't teach them how to cope with awful things. And it kind of just goes back to we're a more reactive than proactive society. But I mean, think about it. Did you get any training on coping skills in your academies? Probably not. And I can tell you the same is likely true of most around the country, and that's a pretty big generalization, but it's not a post requirement. It's not a state requirement that officers get this wellness training themselves. And I think one of the biggest things too, especially in the substance use realm, is it's the perpetuation of bad coping skills or maladaptive coping skills is a better word. Like drinking, oh yeah, we're all gonna go to the bar after and drink like three old fashions to get over this call, so come with us. And that's acceptable and that's okay. Whereas, you know, however many drinks is actually meeting criteria for an alcohol use disorder or substance use as a whole. So I, I don't think we do each other any favors by incorporating better coping skills. I think that we really do perpetuate these manly ways to get through things and, you know, these tough ways to get through things. And it's not doing us any favors because now we have officers getting DUIs on their days off. I think that's one of the challenges that, that we need to get better at is, you know, Max mentioned earlier, the indoctrination all the way back to the police academies. And again, not to be overly general, but most academies still um, teach you that, you know, every pay person you face on the street may be trying to kill you. And that's not really a good place for us to start because that's just not true. I mean, again, I've been at this 35 years. I've had the good fortune and pleasure to train all around the country and, and very rarely have you seen, you know, where everybody's out trying to kill them. Now, you could probably argue in 2020, middle of the year in some, some big cities, uh, there were a lot of riots and some other stressors going on, but not a new problem. Kevin Gilmartin in his book, Emotional Survival for Law Enforcement, talked about this exact uh, issue back in 2002, and he, he's done a lot of work in the space. And all of a sudden, you know, you, you think that everybody's out to get you, you become cynical, you become uh, not trusting, and, and that then extends into your friendships. Next thing you know, you've got what he refers to as his cop chair. Um, you know, you go home at the end of every shift, and you pour yourself a drink, sit in your cop chair, and you're sitting there, we'll talk to you, you hear what they have to say. And then, you know, to Courtney's point, this, uh, let's go out for a drink after uh, work. I'm sure Max has heard this term. You know, we used to talk about going out to choir practice uh, after work, just kind of a, you know, code for, hey, we're going to go all meet at the bar and, and drink our sorrows away. You don't see it as much anymore, I don't think, but it's still far too common. What's a healthier practice that you might do? And I guess I'll throw this to Courtney because I know that um, your organization particularly has a pretty robust wellness program. Like what are some, some things we could do to help organizations replace that choir practice type culture of those activities with something healthier? So I think it sounds kind of cheesy, but they very much organize events that are more adaptive. Like, hey, yeah, we're going to go hiking this weekend because we're in Colorado. So there's great mountains to hike. Shameless plug there. Actually, don't come to Colorado. We're full. Um, but truly, <laughs> but truly, like it's replacing this sense of community, this need of community with a more adaptive way to achieve that. Because in the end of the day, the going out for drinks together is a way of relating and coming together to discuss the problems you're all facing. But just adding a coping skill or adding a substance 
that makes it a little more maladaptive. So our department does a good job of organizing ways for them to get together in a more pro-social adaptive space. But just kind of on the individual level, it's talking about your problems. It's everyone hates journaling because they think it's lame, but truly putting your words and your thoughts down on paper can really be helpful of organizing how you're even feeling in the first place. I mentioned before, a lot of times first responders lack the self-awareness on the mental side of the house, and maybe they're too self-aware sometimes, but being able to put that on paper and look at it physically often can be really helpful. But going back to the talking about it piece, and even you know the getting your first marriage out of the way, the first marriage is a test marriage kind of thought process, a lot of times first responders don't feel like their spouses, if they're not first responders, get it. And they don't want to expose their, their partners or their family to the trauma that they're facing. And so they're so skeptical and hesitant to talk with those who actually could be their most valuable support system. So they're relying on you know their officer counterparts, which is great, but then they're also never getting away from that environment. They are constantly living in the police department which is great. You should have a great relationship with your peers. You should be able to talk about what you're going through with your peers, but you've got to be able to step out of it too. Because if you're always at work, you can't take work off. You know, I think uh, uh, that's a great point, uh, Courtney and and Lord both. I I, I think about activities and and what we could do. And, 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 And I often think about the military. You know, when I went to the FBI National Academy in Quantico, um, we're on the Marine Corps base there in Quantico and you drive around and you look at this place and it's, and I was a, I was an air force brat growing up. So I've, I've been on a number of, of military installations and there's, there are activities. They have an, a whole group that, that coordinates activities and, and, and whatnot. I took sailing lessons because on the Marine Corps base, they have, they had a, a Marina that Marine Corps ran. You, the, uh, Members of the Marine Corps that were stationed there could could uh, go sailing and rent boats and whatnot. We don't generally we don't do anything like that in 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 policing, um, and and I think we could take a lesson from them to 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 in to invest in um, those kinds of activities. And and I'm not saying you have to the police department needs to buy a marina somewhere and start renting sailboats, but I'm saying that. We need to take a more concerted effort, uh, whether that's a, a, a wellness activity planning group that, that schedules and, and coordinates things like that. Would, um, uh, or, you know, I, I will say that Texas has mountains and we also have beaches. I, I'm, I'm not sure how Colorado is situated for beaches, Courtney, uh, but uh, we, we, we're a pretty big state here. So there's a lot we could do. Um, uh, and I'm, I think we need to focus on that as well. Uh, the other thing I'll say on that is, is how do we get better? Um, is uh, that that proactive outreach? We have agencies, and there's some that have started doing this in the wake of incidents. It's checking in on their people, uh, a formalized check-in process where you have you may have a unit that's assigned to do this uh, that picks up the phone and calls an officer and checks in and says, "Hey." I understand you went. Uh, you were on this call the other night, and I just wanted to uh, check and see how you're doing. Uh, uh, see if you wanted to talk with anybody uh, or tell you that, that we were thinking about you, and I hope everything's going well. Uh, it may that may be the extent of it, but the fact that someone picked up the phone, they're already uh, they're getting feedback. It's like, wow, um, man, I, I appreciate the call. I, I, I'm, it, 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 even if even if they don't pick up the phone and, and schedule a, an appointment with uh, uh, a psychologist or or, or or set up a counseling ab- uh, appointment, it communicates a, a value, a recognized value from that organization to the employee uh, that says, "Hey, we do care about you. We, we've got a process in place that we pick up the phone and we, we want to check on you and make sure that you're doing okay. And if you need more information, if you need." need a connection to a, to a therapist, to a psychologist or what have you, or to a peer counselor, we can facilitate that and, and help you through that. That also communicates that, okay, what, I, what happened to me isn't normal, uh, isn't good for me, and there are ways that I can, I can get better or I can take care of myself and, and help me process this. Max, that's an excellent point. And that's something that I think my department does really well is we do have a specialized wellness unit. And 
there is a referral system that, you know, patrol officers, command officers can send a referral to wellness and say, hey, I think so-and-so might be struggling. Hey, I'm noticing this. So it's that active bystandership, but in the form of an easy process to get them connected. And it's our wellness unit is other officers who are assigned there. So people who have been on SWAT, people who have been on our fugitive apprehension team, who actively have an understanding of what it's like to be an officer and reaching out and say, hey, you know, I, I've experienced what you're going through or I know maybe you're having a hard time. Here's the resources that we have. And so I think something like you're saying is very effective and we've seen it be very effective and, you know, even potentially save the lives of some of our guys. Thank you to Roy, Max, and Courtney for coming on the podcast to share their knowledge with us today. Next week, we'll continue our conversation with Roy, Max, and Courtney about the symptoms associated with poor mental health in officers today. If you have any questions or topic suggestions for future episodes, please send us an email at podcast at ncbrt.lsu.edu. Make sure you subscribe to the LSU NCBRT Preparedness Podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, and we'll see you again next time.